Welcome to the first episode of the Bond Business School Business Now video series. My name is Lisa Gowthorpe and I'm the Associate Dean of the Bond Business School of External Engagement. Today we will be reinforcing that business fundamentals have not changed in the challenging times we find ourselves. In today's episode we'll be hearing from Stephen Lutz, Director of Lutz & Associates Chartered Accounting. We'll be hearing from Peter Fielding, CEO and Director of Burley Brewing and we'll be hearing from from Professor Justin Craig from the Bond Business School. Welcome Peter and Steve morning, and Lisa. Justin. Good morning. Our first question to you, Steve, you're, through your time and your career, you've seen a lot of crises happen in the environment. How have businesses managed moving forward? Well, thanks, Lisa. Um, I guess the first issue is obviously this crisis is an unprecedented one in many ways. Um, uh, it's a very visible uh, crisis, it's palpable, uh, walking down the street with nobody there. Uh, who'd have thought on 42nd Street that you'd see no one walking the street? So it's very visible. And of course, there is the uh, health concern that people are actually dying from this crisis. So it's a very, very serious one. On the, same, on the other side of the same coin, of course, is from a business perspective and for the viewers, business goes on. Um, and it is, again, a business crisis. Uh, we still have to earn a living, we have, but we, more importantly, uh, the reason why we exist is to service our customers. So we still open the doors, we still look after our staff and try and look after our customers the best we are. And to my mind, even though this is a crisis of some uh, uh, difference for our generation, the business fundamentals that all businesses have to deal with uh, from government support through to looking after the staff, through to cash flow control, they're the old fundamentals that keep coming back time and time again in the event of a crisis. Thank you. And Peter, in Burley Brewing, so a medium enterprise, and you've obviously had your fair share of challenges over the years, how has COVID-19 impacted your business? Yeah, this has been a curly one, I'd have to say. And we, we um, launched when the global financial crisis hit. Literally, we um, sold our first beer on the 1st of August 2007 and the world fell in a heap. And so you'd think kind of starting out in that environment, uh, maybe we were well equipped to deal with this. Um, the business has changed a lot since then. And I think the difference with this um, this time around, it's, it just wasn't something that was on our radar in terms of risk. You know, when I, I was on the board of the Commonwealth Games, global pandemic is on the risk register for a global event like that. It's not on the risk register for a small manufacturing plant <laughs> in the back of Burley. And I think now um, it will be for everyone. We know what it, that, that this is the type of thing our businesses have to be prepared for. Um, and so, look, for us, I think we came into it um, with two things in our favour, and that was a strong balance sheet and a strong team. And, and they're the two things that, that have been fundamental in, um, in getting us through lots of decisions and lots of challenges along the way. But those two things have kind of um, what gave us our strength to be able to not have to focus from minute to minute on how we're going to survive or will we survive but to look a little bit further ahead and go, okay, we know we, we, we will figure out how to survive because we've got this going, but what's it going to look like? And, and that's been um, a much more positive thing to be focusing on, I think, than, than just getting through. When you say a strong balance sheet, these are things that, you know, that people throw out all the time. Now that we've got Steve here, you know, to say, okay, here, what does a strong balance sheet actually mean? Or what does a strong balance sheet actually look like? And you see a lot of balance sheets, Steve, over the years. So can you tease that out for us? A balance sheet, as many viewers would know, is obviously assets and liabilities and the juggling between them. Um, a strong balance sheet has some basic fundamentals which sound easy to state but they're hard to achieve. One is appropriate capital injected by the owners and the family, so there's borrowed money and there is uh, stakeholder money. Um, very easy to spend your own money, a lot harder to uh, borrow money from any financier, particularly in difficult times. Um, on, it's how you employ the, those funds, Justin, so on, on, on the other side is the day-to-day -day working capital of a business, that's the, the sale of stock, the 
transfer of manufacturing of raw materials such as Burley Brewing, taking raw materials, converting that obviously into a highly desirable stock, but moving that quickly. So, and then to, uh, that stock is then sold to customers. We want to turn those customers invoices into cash. So there's this uh, subset in a strong balance sheet called working capital, immediate assets and immediate liabilities still turning into surplus cash flow over a period of time. The, the other issue is with, so that's working capital, the rest of it is uh, the capital of the business, long-term assets, making sure that the debt that we have from financiers, that the repayment terms of principal and interest is actually linked to the revenue that's being generated from those assets. For a simple example would be somebody saying, oh, I've got $50,000 in the bank account, I'll buy a car for this latest tax advantage, and I've got a tax advantage, but I no longer have cash in the bank. Whereas that car or van, if it's used appropriately for the business, might be over five years. So the financing should be over five years of repayments uh, of that loan rather than simply using cash. Um, it, it, so to me, it's a little bit more of spending the cash to pay for the creditors, to buy the raw materials in the first place, process that all the way through the factory into closing stock into your customers who as debtors pay you that same amount of money plus a margin. And that margin goes into again strengthening the balance sheet further, Justin. Mm. Yeah, no, I guess for us, uh, that's why they're paying the big bucks because he knows it all like that. Oh, I can, I'll, I'll put it in my terms. Perfect. This is a good balance. Don't ask me yeah. to brew beer. <laughs> for, for us, I, I guess. Um, We've always taken the approach that we didn't want to chase growth that wasn't sustainable, that would leave the business exposed and chasing its tail. And, and so not, not paying for growth that we couldn't afford, I guess, in a sense. We would play, we've always played the long game, we like to, to think of it as. So basically, we, yeah, we came into it with very manageable levels of debt, um, even if revenue fell away, and access to plenty of cash. Um, that was, I suppose, when I say we came in with a strong balance sheet, they were the bits that we um, we needed, you know, mm. to, to get us through. Um, and, and how did we get to that strong balance sheet? Through the types of things that Steve was talking about. Yeah. The examples of um, the global financial crisis when you started Burley Brewing, was that a good learning curve for you to prepare for other crises that may occur um, in your longevity? I think every day starting a small business and 14 years later, still every day is a learning curve. <laughs> um, but yes, and people used to ask us at that time, is, is you know, what's going on in the world impacting you? But we had nothing to compare it to. We hadn't yet operated in a world where there wasn't a global financial crisis. So I think that was a good learning, just kind of knowing, well, this is the world that presents itself at the moment and we have to find a way in what's being thrown at us. So maybe a bit of resilience for sure. Like I say, you build that up in small business anyway, but another layer. Um, and, and to expect the unexpected, perhaps. This one was truly unexpected, so <laughs> we didn't expect this one. But um, yeah, I, I think for sure, we probably did take some things from that time, um, along with an absolute belief that it'll always get better at some point. Peter, when you go back to you saying your balance sheet plus a strong team, mm -hmm. that, that other aspect, that key ingredient of that team who has who've grown with you, I assume? Absolutely. And, yeah. and know your philosophies about risk and about how you want to actually proceed and Yeah, and for learn. sure. And, and the first thing we did was gather the team. And, um, you know, what, what we had was um, a group of people just truly with the same approach of together we'll, we'll get through this because that's what we've always done. Um, and very quickly, you know, it's, it's always a fundamental communication throughout the business, but very quickly that became our absolute number one focus was communication down up around everywhere uh, because you know thinking back to those days in mid-march where there were press conferences not just one a day 20 a day and there was news flying everywhere there was media commentary there was social media stuff there was stuff flying everywhere and if I've, you know if we i felt if we left it up um to our team to kind of absorb that news and and make sense of it that probably there'd be a lot of gaps being filled in in a way that weren't how we were looking at things or, or what was going to be happening. You know, if they heard about people being stood down or laid off and made the assumption 
oh, that's what's going to happen here, or we're going to have to take a pay cut or whatever it is. So very quickly, we, I started doing these um, video updates to the whole team. And I, well, at first I did one thinking that was going to be, it ended, ended up being from mid-March to mid-May. I did one every single day. And it was literally just taking whatever was going on, you know, was coming at us in, in the world that day and then letting everyone know what that meant for us, what we were doing about it, what we were maybe planning for, the maybes that we were looking, you know, that, that might be coming at us and how we were preparing for those. Um, and also encouraging everyone, obviously, to um, ask questions and if they had concerns, share them and so on. And as I said, I didn't plan for that to become a daily thing, but the team feedback was that just to see me every day not looking like the world was crashing and, yeah. and being able to give some information about, you know, you probably heard this on the news today, here's what it means for us, here's what it doesn't mean for us, here's what we're doing. Um, we kind of had this running joke that that um, I had started drawing charts because, you know, one of the big things people, it's uncharted territory and it's, un yeah. and I just said, okay, team, we're going to draw our own chart. <laughs> if there isn't a chart, we'll make one. And I carried this black folder around and everyone would, oh, there's a chart, you know, but it, it I think it gave people some mm. confidence mm. that, that we weren't just flying blind and we were actually, you know, making a plan yeah. and um, preparing for what else might come because there were those days when everyone was like, what could be next? Mm. Yeah. And I mean, communication is definitely business fundamental at its very basic. And, and Steve, you've worked with a lot of businesses. What have the good performers done well and how have they communicated to their stakeholders? Well, um, thank you, Lisa. The first thing I can say was exactly what Peter did, which I, I thought was exemplary. And, and if I may, a piece of trivia, it was Florence Nightingale uh, through the Crimean War that actually discovered uh, how to use bar charts to convince the British government to send more nurses over to the people who were dying in the war. So there's another lady uh, <laughs> on the frontier uh, pushing these charts. So there's, I must look into that further. <laughs> but communication is key. Uh, I think also, uh, and, and I'm probably repeating a lot of what uh, Peter said, but from a kind of a fundamental perspective, commuting, communicating as a human that is taking some deep breaths, we're all in this together, but calmly. Um, and as, as Peter said, yes, there's a crisis going on. The governments are dealing with very, very big issues. Let's not worry about them. Let's focus on what we can impact. What can we do? Uh, how do we look after ourselves and our team and our, and our, and our business? Um, I think the next thing is that communication with the, the broader spectrum of your business, um, that is financiers, uh, bankers, uh, but underpinning all of that is a plan. And I'm sure in the background, once people knew that Peter was in the saddle, communicating with her every day, to some extent they would leave her alone and say, I'm sure Peter's working on that. I don't know what's going to happen next week. I'm concerned, I'm afraid, uh, but I know she's got a plan. And to me, this, this, this plan is important. And I'm not talking about an accountant's budget of how much you spend every week, but when you communicate with your creditors, with your financiers, with your team, with your customers, you have a plan. And critically in that plan is, this is what it means for you, the person that I'm talking to. Uh, we've all heard of the analogy of the dangers of trying to save a drowning person, but it has surprised me over the years, Lisa, the number of people that in a crisis of well, however many we've had, well, I've certainly lived through a few. Um, I don't think anybody here is the same age as me, so I've probably got one or two more of those cycles up my sleeve. Uh, it has stunned me sometimes how people can communicate, but very much from their own perspective. And to my mind, that's not communicating. It's all about, uh, I'm communicating, you are important to me and my organisation. Uh, here is what we need to deal with. Here is my plan for addressing your concerns, which I've thought about before I rung you. And here is how I think we can work together on this, be it staff, creditors, financiers. There's no point begging to the bank. Uh, once that happens, you become a 12 digit number. Uh, the relationships that are built up over a substantial period of time is where the bank knows that they won't ring you on day one because they know you'll ring them. They're the customers that they support during the difficult time. The last one, if I can, is uh, other stakeholders. Uh, uh, Birdie Brewing has a uh, number of shareholders. Uh, the successful CEOs that I've encountered, uh, that I learned from, are those that when there is a substantial issue on the table to be dealt with, uh, and it may have uh, some difficulties all around it, otherwise why would a board deliberate on it? Um, 
the CEO will communicate with all of those directors before the meeting. They're not walking into a trap or an ambush. So everyone is actually aware before they get to the meeting so that the meeting is all about discussion and, and decision making rather than, oh, there's a crisis. Now let's talk an hour about whose fault it is or you know, however else they can go. So it's very much uh, respecting human nature and as Peter said, communicating widely, deeply uh, and thoroughly, but very much from the other person's perspective. And if I might, might say, calmly with a smile. There's no other way to ask for help than for that. There's a lot of things that we, we will talk about during this series or over this series. A lot of things you can't teach in business schools, you know, and it means that we have to go out and you're our teachers. You become the teachers to the, the academics. And one of them that you've just touched on there is related to trust. Uh, because fundamentally the whole system relies on trust. And when I hear you say there, Peter, everybody in that system was asking the same question. And that question is, are we in good hands? And the fact that you were there with them every day, you were answering that, that question for them. All of the stakeholders that you mentioned, Steve, were asking that same question. And by actually having that trust in, in you and in that we'll get through this, it, it, it helps to actually calm that word you used, uh, their concerns, and and we'll get through this together, which is around a communication, but communicating. And one other thing that we talk about is related to storytelling. And that's the skill that a leader or a true leader has. And I suppose those people that you come to mind who have got through these crises, you know, are the ones who are mm. consummate storytellers. Mm. Any communication that was going out about COVID within our team, not externally, but within the team. We didn't, we, we kind of put it in a bucket of communication, not called COVID or the crisis or the pandemic. We called it keep the change. And everything went into this. That was the title of everything to do with what we were going through. And that, that this is just kind of one of the quirky things I do, but they do seem to work. It was, I was kind of mindful that just everybody's mindset. Every time we talked about it, we didn't want to, oh, the crisis. Or oh, the pandemic. <laughs> um, and we decided if we call it something like that, um, it will remind us that actually there'll be some good things to come of this. And there'll be some changes that are worth hanging on to. And mm. there'll be some opportunities that we didn't know were going to be there. And um, so every time we talked about it, we had this little bit going, there's some good in here mm. and we'll hang on to the good bits. And it, mm. again, just a quirky little thing, but it internally it really seemed to help. I remember at the, during the GFC, he, he walked around to his people and says, it's not our GFC. Yeah. And it was just that signaling, that storytelling, that the, his role was chief chin lifter. Yeah. You know, he had to walk around and when everyone's chin was down, he titled himself chief chin lifter. And that was his role. Yeah. So he saw himself in a different leadership role and a very much something that people could relate to. So. And it can be a heavy burden when, you know, equally you're kind of in the other half of your brain thinking, well, what's coming next now? <laughs> but it, it, yeah, it's, this is a crisis. To... No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the balance. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess, Peter, your, your business is your baby. You're an entrepreneur. You've been with this for 14 years. You're emotionally invested into this. So obviously having to make the hard business decisions um, in times of crisis are tough. Um, were there hard decisions you had to make during COVID-19 with staff or... Um, Hard decisions in the sense, complex decisions um, and, um, you know, things that had to really be worked through. And, and um, like I said, we've all, always played the long game. And so decisions, trying to make them appropriate, not just for what was right in front of us now, but that were going to be appropriate for the longer term. So certainly difficult uh, in that sense. Thankfully, we didn't have, you know, again, strong balance sheet, strong team plan. Um, we didn't have to ask anyone to take a pay cut. We didn't have to um, lay people off. We, we had to put strategies in place to make that not happen um, um, and developed other parts to our business that didn't exist that we could redeploy people into and things like that. Um, so from that perspective through this period, um, not so much. But, but um, in terms of kind of... Um, the emotional side to sharing bad news and, and so on. I, I actually don't worry about hiding my emotions. I mean, I don't get hysterical, but if I have a tear, I have a tear. And, and I think it's, I, I don't know, it's important for people to know that you actually care, you know? Mm. So I don't always try and be stony-faced 
there are times when you know you have to hold it together at a certain level but i'm happy for my emotions to be there You're yeah human. <laughs> yeah. I'll, put a, I'll put an academic bent on that mm. because the definition of trustworthiness is a willingness to be vulnerable. Mm. So by you showing that that you are vulnerable, mm. you actually increased the level of trust in the mm. system. So mm. not knowingly, there you are. And it feels better. <laughs> yeah. And Steve, a similar question. Obviously, a lot of businesses you've worked with, people do have emotional attachment. They may make bad commercial decisions and you may be the one that has to tell them that their business isn't viable anymore. And how have you done that? Uh, that's never easy. It, it is like having to lay off staff uh, to deliver the bad news. And uh, again, in a uh, in a group environment, it generally comes down to one person to deliver news. And part of my career has been that that mouthpiece for whoever it is, the client, the the chair, the the the, the leader of the group, or on behalf of the financier. Sometimes I have to go in and, and deliver that news. I'm obviously aware that. Um, uh, even though I might feel as though I have to deliver the news. First thing I have to do is to make sure in my own heart and, and mind that it's the right decision. And I think for those people who are placed in having to execute, and that's a very dangerous word I know, but having to carry out uh, difficult decisions, sometimes it's quite easy to arrive at the obvious decision. You know, there there is that X factor there. A lot of people uh, who may be watching this series are, are struggling with what you just talked about then, you know, about, okay, here are we, you know, are we putting good money after bad I think that's the the, the yes. terminology you know we're emo we're emotionally attached to this are there some examples that you can recall where by giving them that news that objective mm. news the, the the real hard facts there's there's relief you know, yes they, they've moved on to well gosh you know if we hadn't you know it's it was the worst it felt like the worst thing at the time mm. but we got our lives back and I don't want to put words into you. Yeah, no, but. thanks, Justin. Uh, well, one particular example, it was a, a very successful uh, husband and wife team and they had invested in a pet project, which I thought was very clever. I didn't understand uh, how it worked, but I could understand its practical use in, in their industry. And they spent some time to actually help me understand that. So there was a process. Um, and, but they had invested uh, $500,000 into the project whilst running their existing business. And each year it was another 150,000. And so I, I said, well, okay, uh, I, t I, I take the role. Can we have a discussion about that? You've invested half a million and you've got a business over here, not quite making that sort of money annually pre-tax. So this is a big spend, it's a big investment. And in those days that bought you a house in, in terms of relevance of what 500,000 bought. Um, and that was, um, that was a bit of blow that their accountant did not support them. And so we went through it and I said, well, okay, let's, let's kind of stop the clock. Um, you're right, Justin, it was, it was a case of, well, if, if we can't convince our accountant, then either we've got the wrong accountant, we'll move forward anyway, uh, or it's a sunken cost fallacy that we're, we're you know, pouring good money after bad, we're doubling down. And I said, well, if we just threw another 100,000 at this, just 100, how do we go to market with this? Uh, like what possibly has to happen after half a million dollars, the, the price of a house in those days, what possibly has to happen for this product to, to make it go to market? Either it's, it's marketable now, and we went right back to the beginning of, why did you make this thing in the first place? You're a clever person, but is there really a market for this for you to get back your margin to get back $500,000 and more. Let's talk about that. So would another 100,000 actually have it on the shelves at the, at the retailers? How much money are you going to make per product to actually get all of your money back? How long will that take? And finally, let's ignore that for a minute and come back to Justin's point. What about our golden goose over here? Our business, our customers that love us because we provide good service. We're so distracted on this, we're, we're wagging the tiger by the tail to use another analogy. Um, and that's just been an example where uh, after some discussions, we just tossed ideas around, accepted everybody's perspective. We then came up with a plan and said, okay, let's just throw a mere 100,000 at it and take it to market. And uh, within a short period of time, not because of me, but because of their efforts, they were turning over a million a year in sales uh, with a healthy margin. And uh, that made me feel good. But 
Uh, that was a case of we've got to stop spending money, we've now got to start making some money out of it. There's basic fundamentals that we're ignoring because it's our pet project. Yes. We've fallen in love with... Yeah, and, and, and we all have that, whatever our hobby might be. And some clients, their, their professional trade is their hobby and that's why they're successful. Um, it's what you do on the weekend that has a work flavour about it that you don't consciously do, but you do it because you're interested in it. And, and so someone who has a, uh, a, a flair for those kind of things is inevitably going to do that. But to manage that, fund it, make sure there's actually a market in the first place, make sure there's no big Amazon against you uh, that will, will obviously push your product off the shelf, and I use that phrase respectfully. Um, there's a whole bunch of business issues about taking a new product, or I'll call the word innovation, uh, to market and making a good dollar out of it. The, the issue about that is, I think, as human nature, we read books and we're fascinated by someone like a Steve Jobs, who against all the odds, was extremely successful. And I pay tribute to someone as clever and as brave as that. But for everyone, Steve Jobs, under those extraordinary circumstances that, that he made his success, there's 100,000 other poor people that ran out of money, ran out of health, their marriage didn't survive, their health didn't survive. Uh, they, were, they were juggling this special project on the side, ignoring the fundamentals, Justin, of the business. Their favorite customers no longer did business with them because they didn't feel loved. You know, they didn't get those phone calls, the relationships broke down, the, the service was poor because the repairs and maintenance, the funding for that was not in your, your business and looking after your customers, it was going to do intellectual property protection for, for something. So there's this mismatch about what we're good at, the phrase I use, when we're in the saddle, we know what we're doing and playing with a pet project, sometimes it, it can take over your business. Sort of picks up on, Peter, we spoke earlier about you, you're in your lane and over the 14 years, there were opportunities for you to get out of your lane, but by staying in your lane, it's it's contributed to you being in a better position. Oh, for sure. And I think that's one of the things that um, these last few months, um, it, kind of one of the opportunity, or it gave us permission to stop and go, okay, all these things that we've got on the go, what matters? What matters right now? Because we haven't... we the way the world is right now it is not appropriate to be working on everything and yeah we've always been um, pretty good at being focused on what's what's um, important to us we're you know the business is built on some very strong um, values that that um, are not just about behaviors but are also about what, what matters to the business and what, what are we going to chase and what aren't we going to chase and everyone knows all that so that, that has helped us stay on course. But despite that, you still end up going, oh, that looks fun. Or, you know, we had this idea. And, and so we had those, some of those things going on. And, and as I say, what this time gave us was permission, again, at all levels through the business, from, from board, you know, all the way through to go stop for a minute. What truly matters right now? What's worthy of our time? And let's just park the rest. And quite a lot of the rest won't come back to life. And that's a good thing. Yes. Mm. Mm. But we, we had... Yeah, we, that's what it felt like. It gave us permission to actually stop and do that. Otherwise, it was, well, we started this, we should keep going or, you know, mm. yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today, Peter. And thank you, Steve, for joining us. Pleasure. And thank you, Justin, for your insights. To the viewers, thank you for watching our first episode of Business Now. And there will be more episodes looking at business fundamentals coming soon. Thank you.